All right. So just had that. one more addition, um, but I, Joel, I think we can get started. Uh, it's seven o three. Yeah. And if you if you could, um, well, now that everybody's had a chance to look at the central dam, the Danby Hamlet photo, which um, the house on the left is is still standing, the one on the right is gone. That's the one between um, that was next to the town hall where our park is you now. Right, where the, the gazebo is. Yeah, and the it one almost on looks the, like there's two houses there. Much, What's that? It almost looks like there's two houses between town hall and the one that's on the side of the... I think it's all one house, but one. you know, it wraps around. Mm. But you know what stands out to me is the beautiful trees. Yeah. Yeah, I know. The trees along the street and the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All gone. Of course, those would have aged out by now anyway, but still. But just what like... it adds, what it adds in terms of intimacy somehow. And yeah. Um, I don't know. Interestingly, thought... they're not they're not elms either. Well, I thought this would be good context to get our juices flowing about the um, Hanlick. Uh, Joel, did you want me to turn off the slides? I, I've just put a few slides in to help guide us a little bit. Sure. The only trouble is that we can only see a portion of the people who are here. Sure. When I can we, see when... them all because I have two screens. But... Oh, is that how you do it? Oh. <laughs> That's why I'm always looking up like this. I see. Above the camera. <laughs> So if you have two screens, you can actually set one one way and the other and the other way? Yep. Oh, cool. Well, probably most of us don't, but. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Oh, that's what's here. Oh. Good maybe crew. I, I'll actually jump back into the screen because I, I thought maybe I could guide. Just some introduction questions. Um, I think a lot of people here know each other, but maybe we could just go around um, the list and have everyone say who they are, what part of Danby you live in, um, and why you're here, not on earth, but in this committee, um, <laughs> what, what your interest is. Uh, so maybe I'll follow my circle, so I'll call on people. Um, so how about Lisa first? Oh, Leslie. Oh, Leslie. <laughs> oh, Leslie's muted. There, um, there you go. go. Um, Leslie Connors. I live on on Durfee Hill Road, um, up where we get a lot more snow than everybody else in town. Um, and uh, I'm on the town board. And is is John? Oh, yeah. So we're on the same computer. So we count as two two votes. I'm Jonathan Zisk, <laughs> husband. Uh, what, I taught high school here for a million years and went to Cornell to get a doctorate. Uh, we're in, we 15 or 17 years we've been up on Durfee Hills. So that, I don't know what part of Danby that is, but when we first came through the, you, you know, the, the market was thriving. I, and I remember even earlier when Benjamin's one stop was here. So my sense of, where the Hamlet idea was going was kind of depressing. So that's why I'm here. I would like to see us have a more thriving Hamlet area in terms of um, community down there, not just in terms of housing and development. Thanks, John. Um, maybe next, I'm gonna skip Joel um, and go to John Jensen. Hi, I'm John Jensen. Um, I'm uh, retired now, former executive director of the Park Foundation, and uh, I live on Steam Mill Road, just downhill in the uh, avalanche zone from Durfee Hill. And uh, I'm here to uh, learn more about how the uh, village might evolve. Uh, pretty much just curiosity and interest. Thanks, John. Uh, next going around is Ted Crane. Sorry, I'm, I'm in two meetings at once, so oh. <laughs> uh, I'm Ted Crane. Um, 
and I live up on Comfort Road. I guess you would describe it about the center of Danby um, on a windswept hillside um, within walking distance of what is or could be the hamlet in Danby. Um, and I, I would like to see the hamlet become an actual useful thing, a useful place, um, but one that is well-defined and contained so that it doesn't begin to spread out to the, uh, shall we say, um, quiet rural uh, character areas of Danby, such as Comfort Road, where I live. Thanks, Ted. Uh, next, Earl Hicks. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Hey, Earl. Welcome back. I've, I've been gone for a couple of meetings, it seems like, but I, I'm glad to join back in. Um, I am on the BZA and um, I've been living in Danby for a number of decades. I think we're getting on about 30 years now. And it doesn't seem that long, but it, it has been. And I live in a tight little neighborhood on East Miller Road in pretty highly high density area in a low density zone. <laughs> um, my motivation for, for joining this group, I think was um, in part because of when the dollar store was was um, planning on or, or thinking about moving into town here. It just, I, I was questioning what the, how, what the impact on the culture of downtown would begin to become. It's, it's obviously been in flux for a long time and it's always evolving, but um, that, that kind of store seems to have a, have a cultural statement associated with it. And I, it, it was just enough of a motivation for me to, to wanna see what kind of, um, kind of conscious planning that I could, could help be part of. So that's why I'm here. Thanks, Earl. Um, next, Olivia. Um, I'm sort of inextricably tied up with the Hamlet since we actually moved to Ithaca and to Danby in 1991. Um, I was two years director of Historic Ithaca and, and brought several grants around historic preservation um, to Danby. Uh, we lived in the Hezekiah Clark House, which is just across from the Federated Church. And the, um, the builder and owner, Hezekiah Clark, was one of the first deacons of the Federated Church. So became kind of steeped in Hamlet history. Um, later on, I moved to East Miller Road, so I'm a neighbor of Earl, but um, invested in properties then, historic properties along 96B with the hope of, yeah, contributing to upgrading the streetscape. Um, I had to sell then 1734 Danby Road, um, and but I still have the two properties that are across from the town hall and adjacent to the park, 1839 Danby Road and 1849 Danby Road. They are five rental units. They're both quite historic uh, properties, but um, the attempts that I've made to try and um, and sort of project this vision I have for using those to become a new have center have just been it just has been dragging along for years now. I'd like to see them um, rezoned if possible so that we could have some commercial services in there and maybe some additional housing density and make that the core of a new um, village center. So that's my dream. And I think most people actually here, Dole in particular and, and David are familiar with this vision um, that I have. And I've shared a lot of the documentation that I've um, put together with an architect. Um, so I've been involved in the Hamlet revitalization plan. So it's, uh, this, is, this is a project I'm, I'm very passionate about. Thanks, Olivia. Um, the next, uh, Gary Huddle. I just came to listen. I don't have much to say. I just wanted to listen. Okay, Gary, that's fine. Um, Alyssa. I thought I'd turn my video on for this part. Um, I live at the very 
southern end of Danby. I'm actually a town of Candor. Our um, neighbors to the north are Danby. So, um, but I live on um, my family property with my parents and my partner and our four-year-old and raise sheep and um, feel very invested in the Danby community because um, like I went to Ithaca schools and grew up uh, around here and I, the Hamlet has sort of along with what other people have said, it's been kind of a sad decline from not that there was so much before, but it's gone um, less. And it's nice to see, I love seeing how even just somewhere like Dotson Park seems to really bring people together and give a meeting place for people to hang out. And there seems to be a real um, desire in town to have more places like that. Um, I'm also like Ted said, very interested in keeping the Hamlet area confined so that other areas can stay rural. Um, but I think people want more stuff and would like it and it'd build community and it'd be nice to see our neighbors places. Great, thanks Alyssa. Um, Alana. Hi, I'm Alana. Um, I live on Bruce Hill Road, which is at the very top of Gunderman Road. There's a turn there and um, so really, really pretty hilltoppy area, awesome views. And um, yeah, I have a lot of the, the same sentiments that others have sort of spoken about. My first, you know, my first job, um, I really grew up in Danby. Uh, you know, we moved out, I think, to this current house that we're living in in 1992, 91 or 92. And before that, we were even living um, off of 96B in my grandmother's house, which then that property later turned into White Hawk, as somebody mentioned earlier. Um, so yeah, growing up here, you know, I do, I remember the Danby market. I remember Mm -hmm. uh, the other convenience store Benjamins and I just, you know, having my first job, scooping ice cream at the Danby market, lots of, you know, lots of fond memories and bumping into neighbors. And there's just, you know, there's not a lot of opportunities to bump into your neighbor, you know, in even non-pandemic times in, in Danby. So if you do it in um, your car, they won't like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think Danby is just, is so beautifully situated um you know we're on a bus route we you know we have a nice wide shoulder for biking in as Alyssa and I like to talk about sometimes you know it's it's just it's nicely set up for I think you know the Hamlet area for some for some retail for a cafe for more parks um even for some you know clustered housing, you know, in appropriate spots, you know, some, somewhere to kind of give a little bit of density and vibrancy to the Hamlet. So I'm excited to learn, you know, I, I know we all have a lot of similar ideas, but how do we actually, <laughs> how is my big question? Um, you know, where do we even start? And I didn't get to get to any of the other Hamlet um, meetings. So I may be a little bit behind on that, but that's, that's what I'm here to learn more about. Thank you. Um, next is Mr. Feeney. Got to get to the right screen to unmute. I'm not running video because my network connection is a little spotty. Uh, that's last fine. Couple of days. So uh, audio seems to run better with a still picture. Um, you know, pretty much the same things. I live a little bit north of, uh, of Ted on the same windswept hillside, um, uh, walking distance to the Hamlet. I remember all the, you know, all the different stores and the ice cream spot. Alana, you probably uh, scooped ice cream for me at one point or another. I remember, you know, running into lots of neighbors down there and it was a good gathering spot. And it's just, there's no real focal point in Danby. Um, and, you know, uh, I think that's a lack that, that does need to be rectified. You know, we managed to have it for a while and uh, it seems to have gone by the wayside. I guess one question is to ask why that is, uh, you know, why it all sort of faded away. 
and um, you know maybe the economic tides have just shifted and it can't come back. But um, uh, I think most of us hope that it can, one way or another. I look at some of the other little towns, like I was over in Brookton Dale the other day to go to the post office and stop at the market over there and stuff like that. And it seemed like a happy, you know, a comfortable place like what we used to have here. And if Brookton Dale can do it, I don't see why Danby can't do it. So. Um, um, you know, that's uh, what I'm here to do is to see what what might be able to be done to uh, to help foster that kind of growth. And uh, like some others have mentioned, sort of, you know, keep it under uh, under a certain amount of control so it doesn't you know spread all over the place. But, um, you know, not to stomp it out, which, uh, you know, some folks seem to want to do. So um, uh, following recent Facebook threads, anyhow. So uh, um, uh, that's uh, that's my two cents on it. Great. Thank you. Um, next, uh, Catherine Hunter. Okay, I ran out because I got a phone call before, so I'm not really sure what's going on, but I guess I figured oh. it out <laughs> well so, enough to say. I came here in the August of 13 because I, for years and years and years, friends of mine in Virginia thought that I, Ithaca was the place for me. And I didn't know anything much, but I found a house that I liked. And then I immediately called the town to ask what I was allowed to do on my property, um, which is really one of the things I wish lots of people would do. But I asked everything before I made the final decision. Um, and then I got immediately hooked into Danby because I talked too much. <laughs> and I got on, on the community council and that helped me get involved with uh, fun things that people do. Um, of course, there were other involvements, but this is about the community. And so I I live on uh, 601 West King, uh, which is one of the areas that apparently was Ted's one of Ted's favorite places to mention that used to be all fields and now has houses. And the ones across the road now do have uh, a lot of trees growing up around them. My side of the road is still original or woods from a long time ago. I, I have some very, very, very old big trees. But I'm, I remember the best contribution I have for tonight is uh, one of the things that, um, uh, oh dear, oh dear, J uh, Jason brought up when he talked about how to preserve the road in a way when some of those pictures about slowing down traffic by if we ever could get the state to agree you know to supplant some trees along the edge because the the one I think one big hurdle for making Danby Hamlet a, a place that could be walkable etc is that the even though people are pretty good about going 40 it's still not it, it's not a walkable. I mean, you can, yes. And Bill Evans rides his bicycle there all the time to pick up roadkill butterflies. And so there are things that happen. But anyway, that's that's enough. Unless. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Yep. Um, and last but definitely not least, Joel. And Joel, um, maybe you can start with uh, a little bit of what we've been talking about and jump into um, some of what has been accomplished or what the, the work of the committee has been so far. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, I just realized that. Um, yeah, just to recapitulate, I mean, why the group um, exists, the, uh, um, it was created as a, as, a, uh, as a consequence of the planning group having been created, which was something that was a, a really important reason why I ran for office in the first place, but that we, we needed to address um, the future of Danby because uh, we were not in a, in, a, in a good place. And then if you're gonna change that, we needed to do it by actively engaging. And this group um, and the conservation worker group were, were early breakouts along with the tax uh, abatement group. And so far um, the we had a, uh, fairly productive couple of rounds with Jason where he um, ran some maps by us, which I hope um, David has access to and, and it's not lost information. Yeah, I think so. Uh, where... Um, where after a couple of rounds, we, we kind of 
homed in on uh, on ways that the uh, Hamlet could conceivably grow. Uh, the, the context for this is that we're talking about um, growing a Hamlet and not just sprawling a, in, a, in a suburban way. So that means that we're, we're talking lots on the size that there were original in the original settlements which are or, or denser and that was you know quarter acre or a third of an acre not an acre and a half to two acres which it's it's not a hamlet at that kind of density so there's a couple of things that need to happen for that to happen um, as well as to deal with the, the small lots that we do have that are so small that you can't put water and septic on them and have any room left for any kind of a you know, house or business like um, the corner of Ball Hill and, um, and, and the main row where um, there was a nice commercial enterprise there. But if you have to go back and reestablish it with, with water and septic, um, there wouldn't be any room for anything. Um, and that's the same problem that the uh, gallery has too. It was grandfathered for a long time while it was in operation, but having ceased operation is the kind of commercial enterprise that it was. It's now constrained by health department. Uh, in ways that that make it really hard to do the kind of things that community would like to have happen there. So we need a way to enable um, you know, shared waste, wastewater, either off you know one property at a time, off property, or clustered, that will enable the kind of tight um, Hamlet development that that we're all envisioning. And this is where we left off, I guess. Um, is, is this the, does, do people remember this as, as the last iteration? Um, yeah. I thought there was one more orange spot. Yeah, I thought so too. Um, or the in, north, in, maybe or near Dobson. Either that or it was two it different colors. Dobson's in. We need to put Dobson's in. We included Dobson's, yeah. In the darker Hamlet core area? Yeah. Yeah, one of the, yeah, one of the discussions we had was, you know, we don't want to sprawl, but the but the, the central area where um, the lower orange um, is constrained by the park now on the one side and the creek on the other side. Uh, so you have to jump across the creek and, and uh, we did we have had, I'm surprised, a little um, unfortunate that, that Russ isn't here tonight because he has uh, been very much engaged with this group as well. Um, where can we grow um, in, in, in an organic, uh, you know, sort of dense way? And uh, that, so Russ owns some of the lands behind uh, Bald Hill Road, um, um, where, you know, there's, there's some area there that, that's included in the orange, I think, on the, on the, on the sort of left-hand edge of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also the, the property from Hornbrook all the way to Miller, um, on the on the east side of the highway, which is um, Dobson and several other properties, which are do not have a lot of development constraints, and and could be uh, you know looked at to as as potential expansion areas, and a little bit on the west if you cross the creek and go on the other side, but because um, Eco Village is on in, in that situation, so, so isn't aren't some of those lots near Dobson's weren't they set aside for adults? entertainment or something like that at one point? Um, it's not set aside, but um, we had to have some place okay. in the town zone for we couldn't not we couldn't zone it out. Right. And I think it's on like the east end of the Dobson property that that um, mm -hmm. allow, admits of the adult entertainment. Right. It wasn't on Dobson's property per se, I think, but it was just, yeah, just um, south of that. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that the adult entertainment uh, designation is an impediment to developing Dobson property, though. Uh, <laughs> you just have to put it someplace else. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you I have to allow it somewhere in the town. Yeah, you don't have to have any of it. It just has to be allowed. It's a quirk of New York City zoning law. So that's kind of where we are. Um, and um, maybe um, David, you could update people. One of the one of the things that we needed to pursue uh, is is uh, how to enable the shared septic uh, or wastewater, some other wastewater facility, and um, and we applied for and, and got a grant from the from the um, county for it, uh, promoting affordable housing. 
Um, but we've had a heck of a time trying to find anybody to do the kind of work we were asking them to do for the $10,000 that we were given. So um, maybe you can update us on that, David. Yeah, I don't have a great update on that. Um, we've had trouble uh, connecting with the consultant who was the one consultant who responded to the RFP. Um, I actually spoke to him on the phone today. I've started calling him. I talked to him last week and said, hey, you know, we're waiting on a uh, final scope of work. And he said, oh, I thought I sent that to you. It must be a problem with email and I'll send it right now today. And then I called him today and he said, oh, you didn't get it. I never got emails from you. There's something wrong with our, must be some server issue. So, you know, I'm, I'm at the point where we're trying to decide if we just relist it, um, but I'm gonna talk to him again in the morning and say, you know, didn't get it again. You know, <laughs> what's, what's the deal? Is this really a, you know, I don't wanna um, send somebody off. Um, Whoops. Uh, if we're having a technical issue, but I wanna make sure we have a consultant who's ready to do the work. Head your double. There we go. Um, so, so that's the update on that. Either we, either we have a consultant who can um, get it done quickly, or we'll need to relist and find someone else. Um, and, you know, we we were asking for when I say we, I don't mean the previous the town in general. Um, before me, the the scope of work is large and the budget is small, so that can make things hard. Um, you know, it's possible that we can do some more targeted advertising to get um, someone else on board who can do help us with that work. Um, but it's a complex question that we're asking. We're really trying to find a way to um, physically enable development. Um, you know, we have various constraints for getting to the kinds of things that people have talked about here. You know, getting the, the retail um, and community space amenities that people are asking for if there's a combination of issues, you know, one is just the retail market. It's changing, it's different now than it was before. It's a very, uh, operating a small local business is a rough, a rough um, bus um, business to be in, which I know because I've um, had three small local businesses in the city of Ithaca um, with my wife and she still works with uh, small local businesses in downtown Ithaca. And, you know, it's the, the economy is changing and making it harder to do those things. But we do know that it is possible. Um, I think multiple people have mentioned Brooktondale and the success there of Brookton's market with really having that community behind them. Um, it takes a special kind of entrepreneur to do that and a community that's really committed to it. Um, and also I think one of their keys to success is craft beer, which is a high markup uh, item that um, creates community and makes it possible to you know, get some cash in that kind of business. Um, and I know that's been a, a part of their success, um, but it, it's not easy. And you know, the amount of traffic and uh, rooftops that we have in Danby around the Hamlets you know, they're not going to pull a lot of the, the corporate um, national models, except, you know, we know we've had some uh, dollar stores sniffing around, um, but getting, you know, a grocery, a real grocery or other things like that, that isn't really locally focused is very difficult. So, you know, we're faced with the issue of the market and then also the issue of the infrastructure, the town does not have sewer or wa water available. So any development has to be on septic and a well. Um, and what we're hoping comes out of this consulting contract is a, a plan um, for how we could uh, help enable either um, alternative systems that haven't been considered yet that can uh, function on smaller lots or ways that we can site septic um, off of lots, creating shared systems that um, 
to be uh, their own small district that the town would be involved in managing. Um, uh, or, you know, looking at enabling properties that are shared, you know, um, a lot of people are really interested in the success of uh, the Boiseville cottages in Caroline, um, which is a really cute cluster development that's all, uh, because it's all rental and not individual lots, uh, they're able to have shared septic systems without um, the banking issues that uh, shared septic brings if you're doing a for sale product. Um, so there, there's a bunch of overlapping things going on there. The, the infrastructure, um, the zoning, you know, currently doesn't allow, make it easy for an entrepreneur to open up a business um, in the town in the Hamlets. Um, there's, there isn't a buy right, um, easy path to open some of the things that people said that they want. Um, and then having the infrastructure issues on top of that makes it even more difficult. So I, I think this people in the group have identified these issues in the past and we're really at a point of trying to figure out what can we do about it? Um, what is the next steps? Um, you know, you know, that, um, what you just said um, triggered a memory. Uh, one of the things we uh, we bandied about in one of, I mean, it might have been the last meeting was the uh, whether you try to relate to and modify the existing highway, which is a daunting um, strip down the middle of the community, in order to revitalize the um, and expand upon the hamlet in its historic location, um, or um, develop a new center that is in a different location, um, but doesn't have that that uh, you know that heavy traffic uh, um, impediment to you know pedestrian and and uh, you know, you know, um, access to multiple places. And, um, and how it got reflected was, uh, the, I think Jason had um, mentioned about the uh, kind of guidelines for if you were locating a business on the, along the highway, what the setbacks would be, what the build to would be and how that would relate to the highway. And we had a difference of opinion uh, in the group about whether it would be better to have it set back farther so that it was not so close to the highway or whether it should be built close to the highway so that it would be somehow connected in a pedestrian fashion to the rest of the hamlet. And um, that's not an easy question to resolve, but it, but it, but it, it did bring to the fore that sort of fundamental question of how do we, how do we cope with the highway? Do we try to, do we just say it's an impossible thing to um, relate to and we should just build something off of it? Or do we try to you know, connect what's there now to anything new in a way that's uh, walkable and not just something you have to get in your car to get from A to B on. Mm -hmm. um, I saw a hand, Ted. Yeah, um, Joel, when you mentioned um, de business development in a high traffic corridor, let me just ask someone, to, anyone to spitball what happens if we did encourage that uh, development and would the Department of Transportation uh, respond to that by doing something about it, like a traffic light? Um, I, I think I can respond to that a little bit. Um, there has been a change in the way the Department of Transportation functions towards uh, I'd say communities, uh, places that, you know, it used to be the position of the DOT that everything was just about throughput and how fast can you get cars through and how much volume can you get through. Um, and they've really evolved in the last uh, 10, 15 years to um, the idea of what's called context sensitive design. So if you can convince them that there's a different context in a specific location, then they can alter their um, design and their priority in the design um, to be more people friendly, for example, in a hamlet or in a village. Um, and I think I mentioned in one of our last meetings, you know, the 96B does not have the same traffic going through it that Main Street in Trumansburg does, um, but it feels much less safe. 
and that's because of its design. Um, so there are certainly possibilities to deal with the amount of traffic that we have and make it uh, a more comfortable place if there's kind of the development context to support that. And I, th I think that's- One of the things that was in the uh, Hamlet uh, revitalization plan was uh, entry treatments for the Hamlet to sort of demark, you know, you're entering a place. Um, and we've also, in the course of our discussions, talked about maybe you know, creating a median with some trees on it or, or else pulling the road back from the edges and adding sidewalks or something like that um, to connect the places, you know, a ditch in the middle of the town is just not conducive to, you know, feeling like you're uh, connected to anything. <laughs> well, I, I, perhaps the best entry treatment at each end of the 40 mile an hour zone would be a uh, traffic light. Yeah, I think and the probability that's pretty slim. Um, oh, yeah, I, build a few I think stores. getting a, a traffic light before there's a lot more. I think getting a traffic light is probably the least likely option, um, but I think the best entry treatment for our uh, Hamlet context is Hamlet buildings. Um, and it always drives me a little crazy when towns spend money on, you know, marble, monoliths or an arch or something like that um, when what they really need is like a business on the corner or you know denser housing that comes to the street that that's what tells you you're entering a place is when the buildings come close and you have trees um, you don't really it's not the sign it's not the obelisk or the archway it's actually having a place that you that you come into and you can see that entering a lot of the, um, you know, I think about Brookendale. As you uh, are getting into the kind of central Brookendale area, the houses get closer together, and they get closer to the street. And then you get a sidewalk, and then you have, you know, some street trees. It's that narrowing of the road and of the um, what's called the public realm, um, the space between the buildings uh, across the street that really gives you that sense of arrival of, of a specific place. David, what triggers like a 35 and 30 mile speed limit? Because we have, I mean, 40 is great. It's a huge improvement of what was, but we still also have a, um, a passing zone going right through the middle of town. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, when I go 40 miles an hour, I'm often people just pass me, you know, right there by Dobson. So I'm wondering what is it that triggers the lower speed limit? I think it would really take um, working with the DOT when they next redo um, the, the highway here and demonstrating to them that this is a different context. And I think it's, we're going in the opposite direction, right? The mm -hmm. Hamlet has lost the villages that create, the villages, the businesses mm -hmm. um, and the buildings that create that context. Um, and while DOT is willing to be sensitive to a context that exists, you have to kind of be able to show them that it is there. They're not generally proactive. Um, although if you have a, a strong plan that says, this is where the Hamlet is going, um, you know, there is some potential to, to leverage that when those conversations start happening about rebuilding the road. Um, but, there's, there's a couple of things, and I'll, I'll jump to you, John, in just a second. Um, in, about changing that context, we're talking about lane width, talking mm -hmm. about um, right now the, con the ditch, um, having a, an open ditch as the infrastructure is a, a very kind of rural highway characteristic, and it's mm -hmm. not great for that kind of narrowing. So um, like that first image we saw, you know, moving to, it didn't have curbs, it didn't even have paving as a dirt road, but yeah. <laughs> when you can move to having uh, curbs and street trees um, and possibly a sidewalk in the future or a trail along the road, that is kind of the, the incremental steps in that direction. And I'll jump over to John, I saw you had your hand up. Well, yeah, I just was curious. I was intrigued by the idea of um, a grass treed, treed median as a traffic calling. Uh, mm -hmm. license strikes me as maybe one of the cheaper things you can do, but 
Is that an enormous bureaucratic mess trying to get that through DOT? Again, I think that's something that's changing um, for a long time. And I, it's, it's still the case in some locations, the DOT sees trees as something that kill people when they drive into it with their car. You know, it's an immovable fixed object in the clear zone, which is the area where you want to be able to drive off the road because you're driving too fast. Um, so getting that, getting that sense of um, being more context sensitive, um, I think is what allows you, those things kind of come together, lowering the speed, um, getting the uh, trees. And in order to have trees, you really have to have a curb that will deflect the lower speed traffic away if someone's going out of control instead of hitting the trees. Um, but I, I think that is something that can be, there's ways to kind of test it out. And that's one of the things that I find really exciting is places that have done kind of an incremental approach to um, trying it out for a day or a week um, with kind of temporary things and letting people see how it feels and building interest around that. and. Um, mm -hmm having the impetus to push farther and, you know, have the engineers come out and see, oh gosh, it's actually fine. It's working. Um, that's something I've actually done a little bit of in my neighborhood in the city of Ithaca. We had a really dangerous intersection um, and I got the city to permit an art installation of um, flower pots and paint on the street that narrowed an intersection. Um, and we got to leave it up for a week and now half of it, they didn't do the whole thing, but half of it has been installed in real cement and grass and hardscape and it's made a big difference. But that ability to do something temporarily um, can kind of get you around some of the, uh, I think fear of you know what happens if we make a big investment and it doesn't work or what happens if we do it and then it's dangerous. Um, when you can kind of test it out and see, oh, well, this part worked, but that part, you know, the bus can't make the turn or um, it's too confusing for people. You can then make adjustments. Maybe we, we can. can uh... <laughs> Sorry, I think I heard John and Olivia at the same time. Go ahead, Olivia. I was just going to say there's always the issue of the big snow plows. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I have my hand up too, says Alyssa. Okay, um, John, yeah. did you want to go quick and then Alyssa? Oh, I was just going to say maybe we as a grill activity, we can just take all our leftover Christmas trees and, and line them up on the center line right through the middle of the village, the hamlet, to see what it looks like. Yeah, John, I was actually... You didn't hear that from me. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually just reading a report from this uh, town in Canada that used um, people's Christmas trees to create temporary wind barriers in parks um, mm -hmm. and make these little treat in areas that, you know, they're only good for a month or so, and then they can have a bonfire. Um, but I, I like that kind of that, that thought. Now, why don't we jump over to Alyssa? Okay, so this is changing tax slightly, but um, I just want to throw out there, I, I like um, all these ideas. I love the idea of the Hamlet. Um, as people are talking about it, but I think that that's probably a pretty far off idea. And when you're talking about businesses, I'm really most interested in what's preventing people who would like to start businesses from starting them. And I think there's a fair amount in the Danby Hamlet that's stopping them. So a lot of people, you know, particularly people who wouldn't be building a new structure, um, I think that the zoning is impeding um, people who might want to start a small business. And Jason did talk about how, um, you know, there's a lot of the attitude seems to be, well, they probably won't bake it, but that's people's right to try, you know, to try it out if they've got mm -hmm. a business and they don't make it, that's on them. Um, but I, I'm really excited about the idea of the town helping facilitate an environment where if someone wants to start a business, they can. And I don't think, I think it's, it's great to have a cute little Hamlet. I don't think it's a bad idea, but to throw out another example, as opposed to Brookendale, I think um, you might consider Stella's Barn, which is closed now. I don't know if people 
went there in Newfield, but that was on Route 13, just busy two lane, two lane highway, cars going by, you know, at 60 plus. And um, that was a hugely successful uh, restaurant that I loved going to. I mean, it was always packed. Um, and so there are instances where if you have a really good business, people will come, people will come. And um, so I think that shouldn't be discounted. The idea that if there's room, if there's room somewhere in town for someone to put a good business, let them try, see if they can get the clientele. And, and I'm wondering, um, maybe you could speak to that, David, about where someone could even put a retail shop or a restaurant or anything like that. Yeah, I think that is, um, it is a difficult thing in the town zoning uh, to find, there, there aren't really places to find that commercial is allowed. There's a, a very small amount of commercial allowed in, in the hamlet um, uh, where the lots are mostly so small that it's hard to do something like a restaurant because you don't have space for the um, septic that would be required for that. Uh, so I think the way the zoning is set up um, is most of the town is the low density residential that doesn't allow any commercial um, uses at all. And then we basically, we basically functioned by allowing, um, allowing people to do a plan development uh, when they want to open a business somewhere outside of the small commercial areas. If someone just wants to open, you know, small retail store. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not. They, they basically have to apply for rezoning. Yeah. And I think that that is something where your average citizen who just wants to try out a small business, you know, they're going to apply for a rezoning, maybe. It's but a big, big hurdle, though. They, they, big uh, hurdle. The, what, what we don't have that, that, that um, a lot of places that have retail do have is existing buildings with retail spaces that are rented out. Um, and then the businesses come and go, but the buildings stay. You know, so it gives a place for people to go to to try something out. Um, we don't have that. Uh, but Joel, if I wanted just to go ahead and rezone my properties as commercial and then sell them as commercial, what if, I mean, I would have to have a project before I can even propose something like that, right? I can't just ask, come to the town and say, I would like these properties now to be rezoned commercial so that it opens up possibilities. Well, I mean, part of what we're, we were embarked on with the, uh, with, with, the, with the whole project that we're, that we're doing here was, was, was how do we enable the, uh, the, you know, the dealing with the wastewater but the other part was how do we rezone and where do we rezone to enable what we'd like to see. So um, and that was the part that we were going to do in house and uh, there's really no reason why we couldn't embark on that part of it, even though we don't have the other part all worked out yet. Because mm -hmm. the, uh, the zoning as it exists, as you as you pointed out, you know, really isn't conducive to creating the kind of mixed use downtown that, that would kind of, you know, everybody's in the back, back of everybody's head. Um, and as far as we got was we, in that last um, slide that, that, uh, that David um, shared that we did have the sort of orange places that, that were where were at the beginning of an area that would be rezoned to enable that. Um, is that any reason why we couldn't uh, sort of tackle that at this juncture, David? Because it's part of the grant scope as well. Yeah, I think that's, it's definitely possible um, to start with the zoning um, acknowledging that, you know, everything still has to get health department approval. There's really, there isn't a reason that the zoning needs to be more restrictive than the health department. Um, even if you allow smaller lots, you know, the health department has to review any construction project, any, um, any wastewater, new septic wells, that kind of thing. So um, I do, generally recommend like splitting those a little bit. A lot of times zoning tries to kind of double count with the things that other organizations are responsible for and it's really not mm -hmm. necessary and usually is a little bit ham-fisted. Um, so I don't, I don't see any real issue with 
um, looking at zoning within this area um, for what would be allowed. I do think that it's kind of a necessary but not sufficient condition. Um, yeah, I agree, but it, it, but it is a necessary and, yeah. and it, it gets us thinking about, you know, what we want to enable uh, along with the where we want to enable. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, for example, my properties are zoned low density and they're across from commercial properties. Yes. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I know the history of it and why it came about for personality reasons, but it just, you know, given what we're trying to accomplish in the Hamlet, it just doesn't seem to make any sense. I mean, potentially somebody could come in and renovate the barn and, you know, put in maybe a couple of small retail shops where people from the soccer fields could come if they're ever soccer fields or just people who are using the park or bicycling. And I don't think they'd have to change the septic substantially. But, I mean, I think based on the, um, the engineer, the water engineer's report, I think we could probably, you know, accommodate something like that. So, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love the idea of working on the zoning so that something like Olivia is talking about might be made possible. I think that's a great idea. I mean, I've had people approach me and said, you know, well, what about that little house in the middle? Could that be used for, you know, a little coffee shop or retail? And at this point, the only commercial um, activity I could have is if one of the tenants wanted to put something in, in that little space. I mean, it doesn't, it's not appropriate anyway because of the septic issue, but, um, but I, I mean, I have been approached by a number of people who are interested in trying something entrepreneurial and it would have been great, but I just think that just in principle, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to have commercial zoning on one side of the street and then low density on the other. Because the people on the commercial side, they have the same water and septic limitations that, um, that, that uh, properties I have. Worse, in fact. Yeah. So, so um, you know, looking at this uh, previous work, David, what is your take on on the um, the areas that are already marked uh, Hamlet Core, is is that an adequate, in your opinion, starting place for um, you know the the kind of zoning that would be associated with it, or should we should it be bigger than that? Or um, I I think that Jason was on track with um, focusing these areas around the intersections, and I, I think you said something about. Um, another node up at what was previously called North Danby, is that? Yes, that's right. right. <laughs> um, so I, I think that the, the thinking there really makes a lot of sense. Um, I think it, we have to be careful with how we zone for commercial that um, we're zoning for the kind of commercial that we want. And I think we can be more precise in that. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, with, with zoning that's, that's more specific and it's not just all commercial, um, mm -hmm. that it's more people focused. Um, and I, I thought maybe I would sh give an example. Um, there's a place that I've been um, that really comes to mind when people talk about like how, uh, how a need to be away from the road. Uh, and so I'm gonna share that a different screen and drop you into uh, Google Earth for a second, um, just because I like doing this. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to share this location. Um, so I went here on a tour. Uh, this is a five lane highway. People drive 60 miles an hour. I, I came here on a tour bus, so I actually got dropped off at this gas station across the street and thought I might lose my life while crossing to the other side. Um, but then you step in this far. Step in about 50 feet. And now my screen's not working all that great. Oh, and here you are. One building away from the street, buildings that are on the street corner um, and you're in a completely quiet, you can even see back there the highway, um, but this far away gets you to a spot where it's lovely to sit outside on a, on a patio chair. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't take a lot of distance. So I think people 
frequently misinterpret how how much separation you need. You need some separation and you definitely need some protection for people to feel comfortable, but you don't need a huge amount. Um, when we looked at uh, Olivia's proposal, um, it has um, some of the same feel about it. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not that far from the highway, um, but the but the buildings that are on the highway have sort of a, I wouldn't exactly call them a false front, you know, but they, they relate to the highway, but they don't relate to the highway um, from a from a retail, you know, business perspective, the access for that would be off the highway, right? In, um, in a sort of central plaza or um, courtyard like um, area. Yeah, and the reality is that we do need the any business needs the highway in this location. We, there aren't yeah, enough like people who live in the hamlet to support a business on its own. We need to draw from the rest of the community. Um, so. Uh, I th building too far uh, away where you lose that visibility and you lose the accessibility by car would not uh, be likely to function well. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that something does, we, could, that we could do potentially on a lot like um, Dobson's. I don't know what the status of um, his property is these days, but that's something that potentially could be accomplished there. Yeah. And Ted asked if I could do an overhead view. So I'm going to share the screen again. Um, just for that. Um, I, could, I could talk about this development a lot. It's actually really interesting, predated new urbanism and then all the new urbanists came to look at it. Um, but this here is the, the first commercial building and this is the huge highway. And then actually the whole neighborhood goes down inside away from the highway after that. Um, and one of the things that was really amazing about the way this development happened is that the first thing they did is survey all the trees and they designed uh, the streets and the layout around keeping mature trees. So uh, it was built in the 80s. When it was built, they had a brand new neighborhood with 100 year old. Um, this is in the south. So the, the tree, different, different trees than we have here, but um, that, that really made the neighborhood really amazing. So the commercial and the housing went together. That was all part of the integral um, concept for the subdivision. Yeah, and it's also worth noting when you're thinking about that, um, I'm gonna zoom out to the whole. So this is the whole neighborhood and this is how much commercial is really functional for a neighborhood of that size. And one of the mistakes that a lot of early new urbanists uh, made was trying to just have way too much commercial. There's really not, you need a lot of people to su support a lot of commercials. So these two buildings, you know, they have a pizza shop and a cafe and a yoga studio and a real estate office and some other offices. But mm -hmm. that was basically all that this amount of housing could support. Is there any way to give us a sense of scale uh, compared to our uh, Doonesbury Hamlet shape? There is. Um, but maybe that's a, an activity for next time because it's hard to hard to look at. Um, one of the things that I really like to do is actually take um, snippets of places that people know or places that you might aspire to and then drop them down on the place you're looking at. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe for our next meeting, I'll make that an exercise that I can, can um, do some work on. Yeah, you can figure out how to put Brooklyn's Market in downtown Danby. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we have the barn on my property is absolutely gorgeous. It just needs a lot of money invested to make it something. It's yeah. deteriorating, you know, quite rapidly. So um, I, I think that brings us to we're we're coming up on eight o'clock. So I'm looking at about half an hour more today to figure out what do we do next? What is the purpose of us continuing to meet and what are we going to accomplish um, in advance of a next meeting. Um, and to help with that, I thought I have a slide I can put up that can help us organize our thoughts. I have to share that screen. All right, so I have two slides here, goals, and what's the next most feasible step? I lied, three slides. And then commitments. What are we each committed to do to move that forward in the next month? 
Um, so I, I started adding a little bit while we were talking about the goals, the big goals that we have. Want more businesses, places to meet neighbors, uh, more of a community feeling. Um, I think being entrepreneur friendly. Respecting the, the historic nature too of the, the hamlet. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's on the fly. Oh, and then making sure that the hamlet is compact and contained. So we're on muted. Those are all all important goals, um, and that then Traffic. the question is. So do we say anything like pedestrian friendly or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Perhaps, perhaps it might be or useful bike to friendly. add. That's it. Yeah, it might be useful to add um, respecting the um, feelings of existing uh, <laughs> residents in the area. I think that's a really important point, and it's also it's worth noting in who Not we existing. have here. Existing. We have um, one resident of the West Andy Hamlet and one landowner in the central Danby Hamlet, but no residents of the central Danby Hamlet. Yeah, we haven't talked about West Danby at all, but a lot of these same things obtain. No residents. Uh, well, a lot of, a lot, I don't know what percentage, but I would say you know, it's likely, I don't know, somewhere between 25 and 50% are, um, are probably rentals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which is very high for Danby as a town. It's very low for the area, for the county. But we could certainly invite um, specific residents. I mean, I know, you know at least four or five people who I could immediately say, let's you know come to a, a Zoom call and and you know share. I mean, the people I know who are residents in the hamlet, they would agree with everything that is forwarded here. But we yeah. could certainly try to have. Um, you know, a, a call specifically with residents. Yeah, I think that would be great. Who I think. Up a little bit further up, say like Bald Hill Road or um, maybe a little bit up Gunderman, but mostly, I mean, it would probably be Bald Hill or the people who would be most affected at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important to note that, you know, the hamlet is both kind of the heart of the town but also home to some very specific people. And I've been involved in processes before where everyone who doesn't live in the Hamlet says, you know, we got to get a lot more stuff in there. And then yeah. all the people who live there feel a little differently about uh, if they're looking for change or not. So when we did the Hamlet revitalization plan and brought it to the, um, to a, a public meeting, um, the plan called for, Joel, it was really pretty suburban development, the, um, the land behind the town hall and the, the Beaners, what was the uh, Beaners property. And there were some residents from Bald Hill who came and were outraged about the idea of having more development in that spot where they, their views would be then affected by the new homes and new buildings. And they were very upset about it. And just real quickly, one, one thing that might attract uh, people to like the idea is emphasizing the idea of slowing the traffic down. Mm -hmm. Having a hamlet will slow the traffic down, which people might like. Yeah. Or having a place where you can ride your bicycle and feel safe. I mean, yeah. things like that. Walk. Those are all important. So with those goals in mind, um, the question is, well, there's a few questions, but the one I'm most interested in is what can we do right now? What can we start working on immediately? Um, and there's a lot of things that we can work on farther down the road, but what can we do now? It seems, it seems to me that, you know, coming up with a set of zoning um, guidelines that would match the objectives would be a good place to start, wouldn't it? Absolutely. All right.
right. Um, and if you are content with the uh, the scope of the dark orange, if you will, um, then that helps to. We've already then addressed the, the other important question, which was the where of it. Uh, uh, I think outreach to landowners who want to develop has already started, but I'm going to add that in here as. Mm -hmm. Isn't that, well, uh, it, it, I could see us reaching out to um, willing players, but um, don't, I would think we need a little, uh, to have a fairly well-defined idea of what we'd like to promote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would echo that as well. I think people find it easier to go towards something they like than get away from something they're familiar with. Um, or at least it makes it easier. So I, I would, you know, look at that issue of who do we have to persuade? Uh, and I think, uh, David, you made a very good point that, you know, the residents in that new commercial zoning area may be pretty much against it in some ways, or some of them. Um, pictures, uh, preference studies, uh, say, here, here's, here's what our village could look like. Here's what the hamlet could look like. Mm -hmm. I think if people could start to get a vision, then um, I think the case making is easier. I think I think it's not it makes it easier. I mean, I think it's critical to make the case at all. Mm -hmm. Incredibly because expensive though, to, to do that kind of thing. I've looked into it to you know take my properties and and have you know somebody create a whole new um, just a whole new visualization of it, but it was just, it was beyond anything I could afford. I don't know, maybe with software, it's much easier now. Yeah, but David was already talking about sort of the um, dropping in pictures of, uh, you know, other places just to sort of create a street, streetscape and, mm -hmm. and bouncing that off of people. Yeah, I, I, I think, agree, that's fantastic. I think pulling, pulling from places that already exist is a, the the cheap first way to start. Um, and it's what I've done in other places. And actually, uh, a local developer, Sue Cosentini, is working on a, a little cluster development in um, the town of Ithaca, just outside mm -hmm. the city. Um, and she's really been expert at pulling pictures for marketing before she even had designs from other places. And, you know, putting this picture of someplace else and saying, this is what we're building, even though it's not quite what you're building, but it's it's the feeling and the concept that you're really pitching at early stages. This is that thing on Floral Avenue. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And her previous development, which was in the Fall Creek neighborhood. Because I think that um, in order for people to buy in, they have to be convinced that what they're buying into will be an improvement over what we've got. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you know, zoning traditionally doesn't get you there because it doesn't it doesn't determine what people are going to actually put in. So we've got the commercial design guidelines, mm -hmm. uh, which is a pretty good a, a pretty good leg up in the process. But um, we can we could create pi pictures of uh, you know a, a streetscape or a re redone um, downtown that, that 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 might be appealing. But we have to ask at the same time. What do we need to do to ensure that we get that and not a and not a Seven Eleven or something that we don't want? That... Yeah, I think going to that. Um, what are the tools that the um, town can use to incentivize the right kind of commercial development? I don't know mm -hmm. what. What tool? I mean, you could hand developers a lot of money if you had it, but. Um, This is Alyssa. I think um, I think that it, I think that there needs to be some distinguishing between this bigger idea of changing the way the hamlet looks and having development come in, which um, I personally see as more long term, um, but maybe others see it as shorter term. But I think there's a difference between that and allowing some small you know, small scale retail to go in, it could even be in an existing house, you know, right. if use was allowed. 
And so I think that those are two different ideas which can go together well, um, but I think I would love for people to consider, for instance, in terms of um, talking to residents, would you be okay? I'm, I'm talking about those hired, I forget how Jason described it. He didn't like to exactly say commercial, but in those darker orange areas, would you be okay with your neighbor having a small shop in their downstairs? You know, so, something like that. Mm -hmm. That's pretty different than would you be okay with this whole redo of a section of the Hamlet, which, which we, I'm sure we also wanna ask, but I think they're two different questions. Yeah, I, 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 you make a good point, Alyssa. And um, I just point out that the context, what you just described could currently happen provided it was the, the resident of the property who was doing the shop um, because we enable that with our home occupation provision. And that's the one thing Danby has done, I think fairly well. But a home occupation, I thought it had to be contained in terms of its advertising and you couldn't have signs out and it's not a- No, yeah. it's got, it's got it, there are two kinds. The ones you can't see and that there's no right. evidence that they're there. That's and then the ones, the ones that, and then the, <laughs> the second class is the ones that you can see um, and when you get to that point, you needed a special permit, but it didn't, then, but that was simply to, because that's what we used to use instead of site plan review, but it was a way of ensuring that the business was compatible with the neighborhood, but it, but it does, but you're, you're pretty much entitled to it. It just meant that we, you know, got reviewed to make sure we didn't create a problem in the neighborhood. And for mixed use also, I just um, was remembering Jason saying that we weren't really equipped for mixed use. Well, no, and what we're not equipped for is, well, that's right, because zoning is all about separation of uses, and that's, that's you know, really at odds with the historical um, pattern. But you and, could put in, you could put in a small retail in your home somewhere if you wanted. Yes, and people have done it all over town. Um, but you can't but, rent what, out the space to have somebody else who wants to have a little. Right, exactly, and I think that's something that needs I see, to I see, I see, okay. And it if came up already. Owner, you could. Right, right, exactly. So, so the you know, why should it be okay if it's the owner that's doing it, but not okay for somebody else to do it in the same location and the same business? So, I guess that's the part that I'm wondering about is the renting out. I didn't realize the distinguishing there between the owner versus the rental. Yeah, well, I think that's something we need to fix, and that it's something that we were starting to get at um, from the planning board side um, when we when we started to deal with the cideries. And I thought so the, the, the question is really bigger than that um, because, um, you know, where, how do we want to accommodate business and where? Um, and and a, we're, we're pretty good with the home occupation part, you know, letting people start businesses in their homes. Um, it's, not, it's not something that we say, you know, has to be in the hamlets, but we could make it easier in the hamlets, certainly. Um, but then what we don't, we're not very good about is, is well suppose you wanted to rent out space in your home for somebody else to do a business because you're in a good place for it uh, yeah that's what i'm sort of imagining yeah yeah or um, even to add some infill to add a small um yeah add a small shop to your house where that you could rent out mm -hmm. i see ted has his hand up just, i'm just visualizing the practicality of that uh before Olivia said, add something to your house, I'm walking down while driving down 96B in the dark orange areas. How many houses actually are large enough to have something, a public area on the bottom floor and living space above? Yeah, are we talking about something that's achievable with the existing um, infrastructure? There was that um, there was that one yellow house that just sold. They've been doing some work to it near Gunnerman Road, that I think is a side by side duplex. Yeah, um, I own that, Alana. It's seventeen thirty four Danby Road. Uh -huh. that it's that it's um, there are three rental units. It used to be called the Country Inn. It was a restaurant years oh. ago, and um, that's one of the the properties that's still zoned commercial in town. So I mean, I always wanted to have a coffee shop in there, but it just you know, it just didn't that, work out. But that that you know that would be a, a prime um, location. Oh, yeah, one. I also. Sorry. You know, I how, also. How, how, how many more are there? There, there are quite a few. I mean, um, 
the planning board's got one that's going to be dealing short with here where they want to do a used car sales. Um, they just want to have a display lot for a few cars next to the next to the house and run the business out of the house. But it's in the commercial zone because that whole stretch from from Miller to uh, to Hornbrook is is um, zone commercial. Right, but that's a really small scale used car lot. Yes, it is. Yeah. The place with the white cars down around Candor or Owego is bigger than that, or was when it was there. Yeah. And so I think there's definitely capacity in existing buildings as well as, you know, it doesn't have to be in the building. It can be on the lot. Right. In addition to a building. There's, there's definitely possibilities for that. And I think there's things we can do with the zoning. Um, if we're clear about the area where we want to see more flexibility for people to more easily open small businesses, we could make some really small business friendly um, zoning options. Um, but that brings us to what are we going to do? Oh, got too many screens here. What are we going to do before the next meeting um, so that we can move towards this goal of um, taking a step towards the things that we want to see? Um, and one thing that um, made sense to me from what people were saying about, you know, having a vision to um, share with people is that this group uh, and others in the community uh, can start thinking about, you know, what is uh, a place worth um, being more like? Um, what is that vision of the kind of end goal? And, and I don't mean um, just, you know, beautiful architecture. I'm talking about kind of a community feeling. What, where are we going? What are the things that we want to see some more of that can be part of this vision? And that's something that all of us could participate in. You don't have to be a planner, or an expert, a developer, an engineer um, to bring some stuff that you could share the next time we meet of you know, other places that have tackled this or that uh, we think are doing better. Um, I think another thing is um, ideas uh, about the zoning barriers for small businesses. Um, I certainly have some ideas already, um, but me coming up with this on my own has some utility, but the more we can kind of share and crowdsource, the better. Um, Jason asked us to do something like this um, a few meetings ago, and we had um, we had to, you know, what are places? I'm um, thinking not so much in terms of a, of an individual building or business as so much as a, a you know a hamlet or or a small town or something that that uh, we they we thought was worth uh, you know em emulating uh, in our situation mm -hmm. and um, we did we didn't have a whole lot to contribute as I recall. Um, uh, Jason had done a whole lot more. Uh, he, he really enjoys taking pictures of architectural context, and so he had a, a, a pretty large um, palette of, of um, you know, places that he liked and, and that he thought might be, might be, uh, you know, something we could look at, and and we did. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't you know, myself have a whole lot of pictures of other places. I, maybe others in this group um, do. I don't know if it's feasible, but really what we could do, David, is everybody could send you a couple of, you know, I don't know, three to five photos of the things that inspire them. And then, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm imagining like what you have on the screen now, but it would be full of all these tiles of, of things that, you know, speak to people and you can maybe then, you know, click on one and the person can explain then what it was about that particular image that, um, you know, they want to talk about. But then we'd have visually in front of us all these really amazing images of things that inspire people, whether it's, you know, for traffic calming or commercial areas or whatever. It would be quite powerful, I think, to see them all together then. I think that's an excellent idea. Um, so I just added um, 
that people can send these to me over the next few weeks, um, hopefully at least a few days before the meeting because it will be hard for me to do it all if it's right at the last second. Um, and that, that chance to be, be broad about it, share um, anything that you think is inspiring for the future of the Hamlet or what you'd like to see, whether it's from the past or from other places. Um, and we can use that to help hone our vision. Um, I think looking for examples out there is a great idea. Um, you know, we're not inventing the wheel here. Lots of communities have gone through this kind of process. Uh, in my ideal world, we'd find some other communities in upstate New York that have gone down this road and um, have had some success with it. Uh, you know, David, if you've run across that or anyone else, that would be great. I think uh, if we find uh, some places like that, usually there's somebody who's very proud of it and wants to trumpet it. And if we mm -hmm. could get them to jump on one of these calls and talk to us about how they did it and what they bumped into and how things slipped by, that, that would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is I'd be very surprised if there aren't a, a stack of books out there on you know, reinventing small communities, you know, some resource materials like that, or even articles. Mm -hmm. um, Again, anyone who's aware of those, uh, you know, give us some links or whatever that we can look at. Um, because uh, I think there's a lot of good resources out there for us if we reach out and grab it. There are. In fact, there's a series of really great um, reports on Hamlets in the Adirondack Park um, that were actually done here at Cornell um, that talk about how Hamlets grow, the different ways um, that they are formed and how they can be supported and improved over time. Um, and I'd be happy to share that with the group. Um, but, but maybe we can use me as a conduit, you know, send stuff to me, I can filter it and um, share back to the group in a way that, you know, I don't wanna fill everyone's inboxes every day um, with long email threads, although maybe, maybe that's productive sometimes. Um, but if you want to send me things that meet these um, these criteria, um, pictures of things that inspire you or places worth copying, um, ideas about zoning to be small business friendly, um, and resources or other articles to share, um, that can help inform our next our next meeting. Um, and I can start putting together um, some of these things as well. You know, I want to be clear, I'm not putting this all on the committee. I think I'll probably provide the backbone of each of these, but having pieces to share from, from all of the people that involve, are involved is really helpful. I, I say this with mixed, mixed feelings, but, um, you know, we do have an urban planning school nearby, <laughs> and um, there may be um, some student projects that might uh, get at some of the issues we're trying to get at. Um, those are, you know, you get what you pay for, but uh, if they're well supervised, uh, mm -hmm. and they're generally pretty smart folks, um, that might be something we could use and, and maybe in a more specific way than, than sort of a big plan way. Yeah, I think that uh, it's best to use students when we come up with something very specific that needs to be done that they can engage in. Um, that can be useful. Um, excellent. So I, I feel like we have uh, a path forward. Is there anything else that anyone would like to add? I am. Um, I was thinking that, you know, we, we were talking, we sort of have hit on it several times this evening about, you know, getting the opinions of other folks in the area, um, those in the hamlet, but I mean, even I know, like, I would like to have, um, you know, a nice variety of input, um, you know, sort of going forward. And I think I could commit to, you know, at least engaging with, I don't know, three <laughs> um, people um, over the course of a month uh, or so, and just, you know, either inviting them to come to the Zoom meeting, or if, you know, if they're not interested in that, if they don't, if they're not set up for Zoom or something, you know, maybe asking just their opinion, I could even jot it down, or they could write a letter or, you know, something, something to get a little bit of extra input um, from the community. 
seems like a pretty easy task. It's a little bit complicated by COVID though. Uh -huh. It is. I mean, I, I do feel like, you know, most of my neighbors, if I knock on the door or, you know, if I come up to somebody's house and I'm wearing a mask and then I stand back and, you know, have a conversation with them or give them a heads up that I'm coming by, um, you know, as, as long as I know that, you know, I'm, you know, keeping it safe and keeping my distance. I don't think it's too big of a problem. If you can reach people by phone or email too, that's, you know. That's better, but you have to know how to, you know, you have to know their how, have, how to contact them in order to do it that way too. Well, I, I think that's a, a really excellent point, Alana. And everyone here has a network of people that they know, and that's a starting place. We wanna get beyond the network of just who knows people who are here. Yeah. Um, but that's a, it's a great place to start. And, you know, I think we've had a bunch of people mention the community park. Um, I actually got some great uh, car advice um, with my kids sledding at the park, uh, not last weekend, but the weekend before I met someone I didn't know in the town and um, was safe outside distance. So there's definitely options available um, for doing some of that. And if everyone here you know, talks to the people that they know and uh, shares a little bit about this and brings back some of their thoughts and feelings, that would be really helpful. I've missed the last couple of Danby fun days, uh, but is that a place where uh, this group could be actually putting up some posters and some designs and uh, fun, shoot for something day. that they it's, gets in front of people? Or it's, it's they it's they didn't do one last year and they probably won't do one this year. Yeah. But. Well, we might be by then because if they, they did it in the fall, last time they did it. No, last, a year ago, January, this time, um, I got the word from people involved with it that they just were not going to continue. It had nothing to do with COVID. Mm. Don't oh, know they how were going to. They were but... talking about reorganizing and doing it a little differently. Um, but I, David, I, I, throughout this whole meeting, I keep, I keep thinking about, um, and it's related to the maybe connecting with neighbors and and getting people's feedback. And I don't. Um, I keep thinking about the people who lived uh, just south of the intersection with Hornbrook, and um, I hate to be, you know, pick on anybody specific, but those folks were uh, there was a there was a proposal for an ice cream shop on that corner, mm -hmm. um, and those folks were especially, you know, understandably upset. You know, they moved into low density residential, and you know, here an ice cream shop with a lot of traffic was going to go in next door mm -hmm. um they were they were very upset about that so and i i assume there's probably other people <laughs> along the highway that have similar feelings i don't know what we could do to um you know ease their mind draw them in uh, get their participation i don't know yeah well Maybe i think that those, those folks I think having people involved is the most important thing. And it's it can be difficult because <laughs> sometimes it's easier to not hear other people's opinions. Um, mm -hmm. But having people involved on the front end or the front end has, that train has passed, but um, <laughs> in the process, um, it's always more better than having people find out about it at the end when the, it seems yeah. like the world's gonna change. Mm -hmm. But also maybe at, talking about options for like, a, you know, what, uh, what would people be okay with seeing? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, mm -hmm. and I wonder if people realize in the commercial zones that are there currently, what is allowed? Mm -hmm. I think there might be some misconceptions about what is allowed or isn't. I mean, there's a lot allowed in those commercial zones that people mm -hmm. might not be okay with that's allowed currently. Mm -hmm. um, right. Maybe they'd want to take some of the heavier uses out and put in more mm -hmm. community friendly uses. You know, I mean, I just, I think trying to uh, talk to people about it in a way that doesn't make it seem, you know, like a giant change. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I don't think we're going to be seeing any giant changes anytime <laughs> soon. Well, you don't know Walmart's in the wings? <laughs> yeah. 
Is, is there a, a list, sir, or a, a little e -link email list now for this group? Because I know Russ Nichman will probably be interested. I mean, he'll get the recording, um, so he'll probably know about, um, you know, our, our, coming to the next meeting with some ideas and so forth. But uh, how will we let the people who were not on this call kind of know then about our assignment for the next meeting? Yeah. So. I don't have a list of people separate from the planning group, um, which is who I just sent the reminder to and um, the scheduling poll for, um, and the video from the, from the conservation group meeting. So I was gonna plan to keep sending everything to everyone and people can drop in here if they find it useful um, or just stay involved at the planning group level if that's what they wanna do. Um, if it makes sense to have have some kind of smaller conversation group of the people who are really interested in Hamlet things, I think we can consider um, a way to do that, whether it's an email thread or, or some other process. But I think right now with people kind of being really in flux between the planning group and this subcommittee and um, just generally being interested in the town, I'm okay with keeping it at that level. I think Alyssa has the... Um who's been involved in which um, separate from the, the, the big, um, the, you know, the total planning group? Well, I only had that um, early on when the committees were formed and the working groups were formed, but then it's been, you know, it's a flux of people in and out. And this is this is only my second Hamlet meeting I've attended and I don't attend any of the others. So I, I don't really know at this point who's going to what. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> and there might be there might be quite a few people who are really interested but they don't necessarily want to attend but um they want to know what's going on and having the recording is really helpful and then maybe yeah. they you know can be in touch with david with some specific feedback or you know or then they identify they say oh i want to be part of that meeting coming up or um you know because not everybody can attend all the meetings all the time but there i think you know, most people are actually quite interested. Just yeah, and that's the reason that I decided to record um, the video, <laughs> the video of these meetings to share them online. Um, I think that that way um, is a lot easier for a lot of people to get more involvement of not having to be here. The nature and of what we're fast doing here through the boring parts. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. The nature of what we're doing here um, makes the video a lot more important than, say, the a town board meeting where you know it's mostly a matter of you know, making decisions. Um, you know, we're going to be using quite a lot of graphics uh, to guide what we're um, undertaking. And if the graphics aren't part of the meeting record, then it's really hard for somebody to even listen in and know what you're talking about. Uh, Yes, and I just made myself sweat, wondering if I am actually recording, and I am. So, oh, yeah, exactly. a, little, a little dot <laughs> says you have been. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I remember you saying in the beginning, "I want to turn the recording on now." So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, All right. Thanks to everyone for being here. I think this yeah. was a productive meeting, and I'm glad to get this kickstarted again. Um, are we, are we um, have we decided when we're next meeting, or, or are you going to do a dual poll? I'd be happy to do another poll. So in the conservation group, people decided they liked the idea of having a poll instead of a set time, because if we change up the times month to month, it might allow people who can't come one month to come the next month. Um, so my plan is to send out a doodle poll when I, it'll be tomorrow probably when the, this video is processed and uploaded and I'll send the link and you can share that with people. You know, I'll send it to the whole planning group you can share it to other people, send them. And then if they want to participate in the next meeting, um, they can uh, you do the poll or you know, uh, respond to me and get added to the email list to get more information in the future. Mm -hmm. What comes from this group to the planning group as a whole, which is meeting what next week? Yeah, I think, um, I don't think anything comes right now except this report on what we're committing to do. Okay. And then hopefully we'll have some recommendations after the next meeting. I'm not sure we're left anywhere now that we 
we have any uh, outcomes yet, but hopefully. No, I don't either. But but yeah, but just reporting where where we are, and what we have done to get to this point is um, brings people up to date at least. Yeah. David, before we jump off, where is the um, the corner that you talked about where you put the art installation and and try to mitigate the the dangerous turn? Oh, it's uh it's Plain and Clinton. Plain and Clinton. Okay, yeah, because that there are some awkward things there. Yeah, it's actually one of the most dangerous intersections in the city. Really? Yeah, you wouldn't think so, but. It's because Clinton's basically a drag strip between yeah. Meadow right. and um, Albany. Albany. Yeah. And all the streets in between there are difficult to cross. So that plane is a particularly difficult one. And there's a big, beautiful old tree that makes it hard to see if you're driving. What direction is that? North on plane and crossing Clinton. Um, so, it was just, if, so coming down Clinton towards 30, 13, it would be on the left then. It would be on the on the, uh, it's north, on the, the south side. It's on the north side. On the north side. Okay. I've driven by it many times, but it doesn't. I don't get a picture. <laughs> I def, I know exactly where it is, but I'm trying to imagine the the art piece there. So oh, we the called it art, but it was actually just engineering. But that was the way we got it permitted. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. Sometimes you have to be creative. I like the Christmas trees down the middle of the road. Yeah, yeah. I'll sh I'll share those pictures. <laughs> Perhaps taking a uh, t taking a hint from the uh, uh, traffic <coughs> calming circle on Plain Street, we could ask for a traffic circle in front of Town Hall and the park. That would be quite a feat. That'd be quite a feat. It'd be much more well, useful. The road is the road is down. so wide that I have some I sometimes wondered whether we couldn't do a traffic circle someplace. Yeah, I keep coming back to the plows. Just think about those snow plows going through. Well, I mean, yeah. if, if if the tractor trailers can negotiate, it, the plows can too. Yeah, but the tractor trailers don't. Well, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> or something I, I like that. You have let's to visualize. Yeah, yeah, let's visualize those those uh, yeah. the median strip. A narrow median strip would already be something with trees. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for all the ideas. Bye. Good night. Night. Night all. Good night. <laughs>